This episode of Fuel for the Soul is powered by ASICS. Head over to ASICS.com and sign up for a one ASICS account. It's completely free, and when you sign up, you will receive 10% off your first purchase. You'll also gain access to exclusive colorways on ASICS.com, free standard shipping, special birthday month discounts, and more. Hi, this is Thomas with Believe in the Run. This is Megan with Believe in the Run. And this is Megan with Featherstone Nutrition. The feathers, the most important part of the show, the one that actually knows something. Megan and I are here just like a live studio audience <laughs> while Meg Featherston Feathers gives the real smart stuff. The knowledgeable one. Yeah, the brains of the group. It wouldn't be any fun with just me, though, guys. We need this. We need I know. This. I was thinking about how boring it would be oh, if, if you were by yourself. Yeah. <laughs> like the last podcast. No, I'm kidding. No. Oh, no. Uh, that was good. Wait. Yeah. Did, Megan wasn't on that one? No, Remember, I was like kind of there. She was and then I was having those fun issues. And now we have a whole new internet. All right. Well, <laughs> we got a good internet now. We've got, I think, the most exciting person on here, Feathers, to talk about. Can well, we move this so that you're, it's not in there? All right, yeah, that's fine. I'm good. Look at this. Okay. I'm getting custom work done okay. right now Okay. while we're doing this. Anyway, I was just giving more flattery to feathers. Like, it really does. I was telling Megan today, there's like different pillars that Believe in the Run has. And one of them I think is we have a ton of shoe knowledge. We've been reviewing shoes for over 10 years, almost 15 years now. And then you've got the legitimacy of Megan, who is just crushes runs and has gone from a 356 to a three. Feathers is the same story. Yeah, yeah, I'm getting to her. I'm getting to her. <laughs> I said talk three about pillars. You for a minute. <laughs> okay. You've dropped your time from a 356 marathon from the start down to a 245. Five. And and it's and we're still going after improvements. And then we've got Megan, the brains, the speed, the whole thing, the whole package. Bringing it in—that's that's a that's a lot of a lot of power in a tiny little package. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. So I'm excited about it. Anyway, it, this is the show, <laughs> and I'm gonna actually tell us what we're talking about today because I'm fired up about this because I feel like we're I feel like we're getting snake oiled. I feel like big pharma is is doing commercials and and masking it as. A TV show. They pulled Oprah out okay, of the woodwork. Okay, so time out. We're, today we're going to talk about some hot topics, and one <laughs> of them is Ozempic, and it's because I make Thomas watch, well, I would I would used to say make Thomas watch The Bachelor with me, but now he is more invested than I am. So we typically watch The Bachelor on Monday evenings, and instead of The Bachelor a couple of weeks ago, Oprah had an Ozempic special that really felt like an Ozempic ad. 100% was long paid one. for by Ozempic. Yes. Paid promotion. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and I'll go over, I go, and, and I will say, I'm not gonna, I'm not shy. I, I enjoy watching The Bachelor with Megan. <laughs> I think my favorite thing about it though, isn't necessarily the show. It's that Megan sits down because you're a very active person. You're always doing something. So I love that you just sit down. We kind of like relax together it's nice. It's fine, Thomas. You like The Bachelor. We're moving on. It's okay. <laughs> anyway, they pull Oprah out of retirement, throw her up on this stage, and they start off with the propaganda for this Ozempic. It wasn't Ozempic even. It was Manjaro as well. Um, they start off with the propaganda about it that we've been treating obesity wrong in this country, that it's not a uh, it's not the responsibility of the person it's a disease that we have that if your genetics set you at a certain weight, you can't fight that. That's the way it's going to be. And they went off. And at first I was like, okay, I get that. But I go, why is America the only country that has this disease right now? So feathers, why are we have, why do we have a disease the rest of the world doesn't have? Well, I think they're probably, I, that's a great question, but I don't know how they're classifying obesity in other countries, but I have to believe it's, I mean, we've all traveled a lot. Like I'm sure that it's yeah. an issue other places too, but I think Ozempic is something that's creeping into the discussion more than I would love 
that it is. So that's why we're talking about it today is to talk just a little bit more about what this looks like, because I think people have questions. And as you guys saw, there might be some misinformation out there. Um, so I guess we should probably take a little bit of a step back and talk about like, what is Ozempic? So there's a bunch of different drugs. That's a brand name. There's also um, Victoza, Saxenda, Wagovi, different manufacturers make different medications, but these all fall under a class of drugs called GLP-1, which stands for glucagon-like peptide. So it's a hormone that our body already produces that we are now putting in a drug form that we have to inject into our belly usually once a week to give our body more of this specific hormone. Wait, is Ozempa, is Ozempic an injection as well? Yes. Where I am cautious or where I feel like this is a little bit scary is that it definitely felt like they brought out someone who has struggled with weight for their entire life and said she's found the magic pill and it happens to be a drug that is going to make millions and billions and billions mm -hmm. of dollars off of people who some of those people I say, yes, you, you probably can benefit from the extra help of the drug. But I'm going to say there's probably more people that are going to use it in and abuse it. Mm -hmm. And then we don't really know. We don't have mm -hmm. the data at this point to show. And you tell me that because you're the you're the sciencey person. But I don't think there's we're going to know what the effects of this is for, mm -hmm. you know, 10 years. Mm hmm. Yeah. And that's a concern. And we'll definitely talk about the abuse of the medication here in a minute, because I think that's where I see it crossing into the running world a little bit more. Um, but I mean, when we take a step back and we look at what have we done to try to help the quote unquote obesity epidemic over the years, we have done some ludicrous things. Like when we look back at like yeah. gastric bypass surgery, I'm not clinical anymore. So I'm not sure how often that's still happening, but I don't think that that's the frontline defense to type 2 diabetes anymore like it was 15 years ago. I mean, we were cutting out people's stomachs and bypassing a third of their intestines thinking that this was the answer, right? So, you know, I think we, who knows if we're going to look back at this and, and say something similar. I, I'm not saying if we are or we aren't, but we are very obsessed with weight. We are very obsessed with whether someone's weight isn't where we think it should be. So when I when I look at, you know, back to Thomas's thing about, you know, why is obesity a disease here and nowhere else, you know, whether that's true or not, when I look at someone and I assess someone from a nutrition standpoint, I could honestly care less what their body weight is. We need to find out if they're healthy in the background. So if somebody is at a weight that is unhealthy for their body and they have some different um it met, or different issues going on, whether it is type 2 diabetes, which could be weight related or it could not be weight related, right? But if we have some things that's like, okay, I've gained some weight and now I'm dealing with X, Y, or Z from a medical standpoint, it would make sense to be like, hey, if you're interested, let's talk about like, how can we change this? Do we want to try to control some of these diseases, you know, through diet, through exercise? And if that person's like, absolutely, then we do it, right? But there are some people who are quote unquote from a BMI obese that are perfectly healthy, you know? So I think like it's a very nuanced discussion as far as um, it, it, these weight loss medications because they are just linked to BMI. So when you look at like, if you're allowed to prescribe it, yeah. It's also interesting though, like we've done all this work on body positivity. Mm -hmm. And as soon as this pill comes out, people are like, screw that. Let's jump on this, this pill. Right. Like I'm like, it, it just sends a crate, like, I don't know what message we're supposed to be following right, right now. And it, it's getting us right back down that spiral that in order to be healthy, in order to be successful, in order to be affluent in this society, you have to be skinny, right? Like that's what this Well, they basically like said that. Back. Yeah. Oh, that makes me mm -hmm. sick. Yeah. They said that they, you get treated. Yeah. Like this one mom came on. She's like, yeah. I get treated different. I was invisible. My kids get treated better now that I'm like that because I'm uh, not obese. My kids get treated better. Oh my gosh, and that like, was in that this. That would oh. just break my heart. That would break my heart yeah. if I was a mom and I thought that I was damaged or, or a yeah. father damaging yeah. my children because of my yeah. obesity. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, this is, we could talk for hours and hours and hours about, you know, like bodies and how we address them in our society. And I don't know that we'd ever, you know, come up with the right answers, but I truly believe like, if someone is living their healthiest life, like everyone's body is going to look different genetically. Like everyone's body is going to look different. I think I read a quote yesterday that 40 to 70% of what we look like physically is genetic. 
So it, it's, you know, everybody's like, oh, Megan, why do you have abs? Because I have a really long torso and that's just how I was born, right? Like, you know, I mean, every, each of us have certain things about our bodies that it just is what it is. So, um, you know, I think it's it's important to, to take that into consideration as well. And then the health benefits of it all, of course. Um, but I guess maybe we should take a step back and like, what are the purpose of these drugs? Like, why would someone need yeah. to be on them? So they were actually initially, initially not a weight loss drug. Initially, they were for blood sugar control. So this GLP-1 hormone increases our body's own production of insulin. So when someone has type 2 diabetes, their body is not producing enough insulin, so their blood sugar gets too high. So this GLP-1 hormone helps our body create that insulin when we, our body's not doing it very well anymore, which then decreases our blood sugar levels, right? So these GLP-1 drugs were really great when they first came out for type 2 diabetes and helping people manage that, you know, and getting their A1C down. And people saw like a lot of really good improvements there. And be, and then they started to see the side effect of this. It's like, oh my gosh, these people are losing weight, which then was helping their diabetes even more. So then people were trying to get their hands on these drugs for weight loss. So now there are a couple of them that are actually FDA approved for weight loss. But for a while, it was kind of just being used almost under the table for diabetes or weight loss. So now we're seeing, right, that they're available for weight loss. They're a prescription drug. It's not something that you can walk in and buy, you know, off the counter. And when we look at who's allowed to have access to them, if our BMI is over 30, someone could have it. Or if their BMI is over 27 and they have type 2 diabetes, hypertension, something else going on, they could technically be prescribed these medications. What I am seeing, which is very, very concerning, is in some states, if you want it, you can get your hands on it no matter what your body weight is. And that is very, very scary to me, especially as I've seen this start to trickle into the running community. Well, can, can I ask you a question real quick? Because mm -hmm. you talked about lowering blood sugar and you're kind of getting science -y on it. But what it, from what I understand, what it does is it kind of is an appetite suppressant. So these people on, on the commercial or show, whatever you want to call it, they were saying their days were consumed with thinking about food. This was part of the disease, they said, that they couldn't stop thinking about food. And the taking one of these pills or one of these injections was they didn't, they weren't thinking about food all day. They weren't thinking about their next meal. They weren't thinking about, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that. Um, is it just a, like, is that why people are losing weight? They're just not hungry. And, and like, I don't know if you have a habit, like if you know, like I have a habit, I, I noon hits and I start going, Oh geez, I need to eat. Uh, it's time for lunch. It's like clockwork. I don't, would that, is, if I was taking one of those things, would I just forget about yeah. lunch and is not eating the answer? Right, right. So you bring up a really good point that we didn't touch on yet. So the weight loss piece of it, we found is a little bit different, right, than the blood sugar management. So the GLP-1 hormone also slows down gastric emptying. So our food stays in our stomach longer after we eat, which keeps us full longer so that we, you know, don't aren't thinking about food as much, but the GLP-1 hormone is also active in our brain. So it, we find that we have an increased sense of satiety, which means we feel fuller for longer after meals, both from that delayed stomach emptying, but also because of how this hormone interacts in our brain. And exactly like you just said, well, people who have taken it say that they just don't think about food, that like the food noise, the preoccupation with food, the constantly thinking about food, the cravings are just gone, that they just have more control over being intentional about what they choose from a nutrition standpoint. And then too, if you overeat, you feel really sick, you feel nauseous, you feel sometimes you even throw up. Um, yeah. So it's like a built in mechanism, right from that. So yes, there's some things going on that, that, help us eat less, right? It's not increasing our metabolism. It's not making us burn more calories. It's helping us consume a more moderate amount of food throughout the day, which then obviously on the backside, um, you know, ends in weight loss. But to your point, back in my prior life, um, our employees were allowed to be prescribed oh, one of these GLP-1 hormones and we were tracking them to see who was being, who was having success with it and who was not. And we found that a lot of people were actually not having success with it because to your point, Thomas, like 
just because you don't think about food, if you have a habit or a behavior of overeating or over snacking, or you're an emotional eater, it's not going to help with that. It's only going to help. Or you decide I'm eating less, but I'll eat something high Mm -hmm. caloric, but not high nutrition. Right. So it's not like automatically going to work. We have to change our habits and behaviors along with using the medication. And I will say, I worked with a couple people who had crazy success on this. I worked with a guy who lost 120 pounds taking this medication because to your point, he wasn't thinking about food. Like he was able to be more intentional. Like, okay, Megan wanted me to have protein. She wanted me to have this. I can't eat too much fat or I feel sick. Like he had to be intentional about it. But then I saw people that gained weight taking it, you know? So it's not a magic bullet, just like nothing is a magic bullet. But, you know, when we think about, I guess, so kind of segueing, I got tagged in a, um, comment on Allie and the Run's Facebook group because someone, their their direct question was, I'm starting a marathon build and I'm 10 pounds heavier than I want to be. Should I start taking Ozempic to get to my race weight? Oh, wow. Yeah. That's crazy. Right. And that's my concern here and that people are going to get a hold of this for more of a vanity weight loss than an actual medical need to actually lose weight. Yeah, because this is... This medication is for someone who needs to probably lose like 50 plus pounds, right? Correct. Not someone who needs to lose 10. Correct. But you know that the people are going to... Right, abuse like, it. Uh, it. It reminds me of ephedra and that mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah. But the thing that I'm... Uh, there's got to... Like there, you, I always feel like there's a balance. And if you add something in to your system that wasn't supposed to be there... There's going to be. Yeah, I'd be so seesaw. curious to know if they're like, obviously, this is not for performance or athletes like it's not intended. No use is that at all. So I I would wonder if there is any negative consequences to your performance, because, I mean, who knows? We have no idea. Right. Well, first off, if it's not letting you clear your gut. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to have issues. That sounds complicated on its own. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Fueling. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And. When, when I was watching the program, it wasn't necessarily for the way over obese, o- obese people. I felt like this was a commercial saying, It hey, came on during the Bachelor hour. That's like, that is, yeah. yeah. That's my like, issue. Like, I felt like this, this was yeah. like, let's get yeah. as many customers as yes. we can. 100%. Yeah. And yeah. then they, it was, then you start hearing the rumors and it was kind of, I don't want to say it was a campaign, mm-hmm. but even on Instagram and stuff. I'm scrolling the feed. You start seeing like articles about this person is on Mm -hmm. Ozempic or this, this Mm -hmm. star is rumored to be using uh, this drug Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So it's like almost like celebrity endorsement, like, Mm -hmm. like, Ooh, it got leaked that this person's using it as well. And you're just like, wait a second. They got Oprah, probably one of the toughest celebrities to get to endorse your product. Mm -hmm. They've got, you know, other people now rumored to be using it. And you're like, uh oh, like this is going to become an epidemic. Well, and you can get so I have a lot of people who have reached out to me very concerned because their friends that they run with have started taking it speci- oh, wow. in specific states. Anyone can get their hands on it. You can call a hotline and get it prescribed to you. You can go to. I thought like it was over the, the counter corner. at this point. No, you can go to like a corner weight loss facility and no matter how much you weigh, what you look like. Maybe you've got a raging, you know, eating disorder in the background. They don't care. They'll prescribe it to you. So it's getting a little crazy. So my concern with this is, so it decreases your appetite, right? So we're not eating as much. So, and then it's it's a drug that is marketed to take forever. Like you said, Thomas, they're marketing it as obesity is a long-term you know, disease state. So we need to take yeah, this once medication you're on forever, it, you're on it. like we would hyper- a hypertension med, right? Like at some point, if you're on that hypertension med, you need it forever. So you don't have a stroke. Like that's kind of how they're marketing this. So what happens when we go off of it, when we're using it for vanity weight loss, we don't know. But my thought is what I've seen with people, especially if we're not having those signals to eat, we're not going to fuel well before and after we're not going to recover well. And if we're chronically not eating enough, which would happen on this medication, we're not going to hang on to muscle mass. We're going to lose a significant or bone amount density. of muscle mass, bone density. We're going to be throwing these athletes into red ass in a hot second because 
these people were already probably under fueling and now we're giving them a drug that allows them to under fuel without ever feeling hungry. Um, I mean, it's just petrifying to me, the injury risk here. And then two long-term consequences, like, okay, you're like, have a aha moment. And you're like, this drug was a terrible idea. I shouldn't have done this. I'm not healthy. I'm injured. I can't run anymore. So then you stop and now your metabolism is shot because you've lost so much muscle mass. And then you gain weight and it's on this yo-yo. And now you're, you know, like, it just seems like it could be awful (laughs) for this to enter the running community in my eyes. Yeah. I, I hope it's like a short lived thing that comes in really hot and leaves just as quick, Mm -hmm. but I guess we'll see. I, I, I feel like these things don't leave unless like, like a Fedra didn't leave until the government was like, nah, you can't stop people's (laughs) hearts. People were dying. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. People are popping. Um, But like, I, and you think back to like, in the 70s, and this is before my time, but I know a little something about it, is uh, Valium and all the stuff that they were giving women for, uh, I guess it was somewhat depression back then, but they didn't know what it was called. So they were giving people downers and uppers. Okay. Uh, and so, you know, people were basically in their house drinking wine and, and taking, you know, Valium and, and mm-hmm. sleeping all day and then mm-hmm. taking uppers to party at night mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And it created... Like now you can't, those, those are not available to the, to the public anymore. Yeah. Maybe this is going to be more like a Adderall. It's going to be like a black boxed (laughs) medication at some point. I mean, I, I, in the right people's hands, I think this medication and with lifestyle habit changes, I see why this medication should be put out there. I'd rather somebody do this than gastric bypass. Right. But the allure of this medication and the ease of getting it for certain people. Like, think about it. If you're somebody who is like, I really want to lose that 15 pounds, it's really preoccupying. And all of a sudden there's this carrot dangled in front of your face. That's like, you're never going to feel hungry. Just take this. Like, or just people are going to be like, okay. Yeah. A lot. Or you see other people doing it. That's the big one. I mean, another drug that, that, that seemed to get out of control, which is now being reined in is, is oxycodone mm-hmm. and oxycotton mm-hmm. uh, those? I, I mean, yeah, in the early two thousands, you could get that anywhere. Like not anywhere, but you, you yeah. all, we all had friends that had a yeah. bottle of uh, yeah. of it around, and it, yeah. it's like they were saying, "Oh no, this is just a painkiller," and mm-hmm. turns out it, cr- it caused an epidemic of people getting hooked onto heroin, right? And, and stuff like that. I don't yeah. know. This is that dark, but. No, but I think I think from a health standpoint, we're allowing this to get into certain people's hands. We're creating a whole new health crisis in my eyes, you yeah. know, a very undernourished people that, to your point, now have osteoporosis, osteopenia at a young age, have muscle wasting at 40 instead of 70. You know, like there's all sorts of, you know, concerns here for long term health if we're taking something like this. Yeah. Will the symptoms be similar to people that uh, are suffering from anorexia who are not using a drug to control their appetite, but yeah, I mean the the bottom line concern is malnourishment, right? Like it's kind of red s in the in the um, running world or any type of athletic world. But when we're not getting adequate nutrition for long enough, every single health, every single body function is going to cascade and have issues from our bone health, from our hormonal health, from for obviously for the fertility piece of that, from our heart health, right? We can see crazy heart damage from underfueling for too long and then add in endurance exercise on top of that. It's then stressing our heart when we're underfueled day in and day out. And it just, it's just a recipe for long-term damage, honestly. I mean, we're assuming most of our listeners are athletes and right. are right. here to increase their performance. Mm-hmm. So generally speaking, this is not, this drug just stay away. It's like not for it's not for us, right? Right. And if there is somebody who's like, no, I really am unhealthy and I need to lose 80 pounds and I have these health conditions that I know I'd be able to manage if I could just get this under control, work with a physician that is going to prescribe it under the right guise for you. Work with someone to change your lifestyle habits. Have running take a backseat. Just run for fun. Don't do anything crazy performance. And then just see how we enter back into the actual training piece. Because there are people out there that are like that. And I don't want to say this medication isn't appropriate for anyone. I just think the abuse of this medication is what, which is to your point, more of our listening audience. Yeah. Um, Okay. The one last thing I want to say on the Oprah Zempic special is that she said she no longer eats a whole bagel. She only eats half a bagel. And F that Oprah, eat the whole (laughs) bagel. 
But maybe I'm so mad at her. Maybe there's something I'm else not. she doesn't need to eat. No, eat the bagel. Okay, that's it. We're oh, moving on. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I. I she's mean, now on my hate list if she only wants a half a bagel. Okay. Yeah. We're gonna talk about some other hot topics, listener questions. Megan, we just aired a couple of weeks ago a podcast with Josh Rowe, the science perf- performance scientist mm-hmm. at Morton, and mm-hmm. I didn't get this, or we didn't no. get this feedback. Um, but you got some feedback asking why you didn't challenge him. Yeah, so I had a few slightly angry, slightly heated. I don't know if I would say angry. I don't think any of you guys ever reach out to me angry. But um, just challenging why I didn't push him more when he said most people don't need sodium for the marathon distance, right? So this statement was not new to me. I have heard this multiple times through different realms, different people that they you know, just don't think that marathoners need sodium. And we want to take a step back and remember most of their test subjects are very fast elite athletes. So they're only out there a little over two hours and most elite athletes don't sweat very much. Like if you look around, most of the most successful runners are not super sweaty humans, right? So Kipchoge probably doesn't need sodium when he's out there running, right? So like the the realm that he's been researching in That's what he's found. But we know that we aren't, uh, most of us, I should say, speaking for myself here, elite athletes. We all have different sweat rates. We all have different sweat compositions. That is genetic. That is not something we can change. And we know that when we're out there for more like three, four, five hours, that if we don't get adequate sodium and we're losing a lot, that we will have performance you know, issues out there, whether it's GI issues, whether it's headaches, whether it's cramps, whether we can't hold paces, uh, whether our core body temperature gets too hot. Like We know that there's things that are going to happen. So I knew his stance and my stance was just getting more information from him about, so what is what do you know about sodium along with Morton products? And we asked a bunch of questions and he did say, like he gave some advice on like, if you did want to use sodium products with their products, this would be in his opinion, the best way to do it. So my goal is never to change someone else's mind that we're interviewing. It's just to get the information that we need so that we can all help each other. So if anyone's wondering why I didn't challenge him, that is why. It's interesting because I do like the product. I am I'm not using the gels as much because I it, there's something about the uh, stickiness or whatever that uh, it, I think has caused some of my coughing during mm-hmm. um, races. I think it just coats my pipe or something. Um, I'm seeing more people talk about GI issues with Morton than like it seems like it's been around now for four or five years, and it's now all of a sudden I'm hearing people talk about it causing the problems even Robbie uh Redinger who's who's you know over here uh he he was on a run and he thinks one of his ones broke down due to heat and caused an issue and the thing that I was thinking is so it's packed in this gel that's supposed to help it bypass your gut if that gel breaks down or something whether it's through the expiration date on the package or heat breaks down the gel or whatever, because I've noticed that Ironmans, they keep it on ice. Um, and then uh, you're getting it. Maybe maybe people are doing exactly the opposite of what the gel is supposed to be doing. It's possible. And, you know, that's the reason why I'm so glad that we have so many options to fuel our runs. I mean, you know, Meg and I use Morton gels, but, you know, I think the cool thing about talking with Josh was he's a scientist, so it was more just talking about the science of fueling and not necessarily yeah. a specific sport or a specific brand, even though he does work for a specific brand. Um, and that's what, I mean, one thing's not going to work for everybody, you know? So I think it's important that we keep trying until we find what works. Yeah. I also saw on Instagram yesterday, someone post their bicarb, um, Said it improves performance by 24%, which I thought was yeah. nuts because they even say it's 2%. Uh, on on their website, and he Morton. quoted some he quoted some science. He put up uh, uh, screenshots of webs, of like <laughs> websites. some research study. You couldn't read it. Um, but what I also found was very interesting is that I went I had to go through all the comments because I was like, oh, everyone must be questioning this. No one questioned the twenty four percent. Everyone just said, why aren't you just using? Um, why aren't you just training soda? No, why aren't <laughs> baking soda? They're mm-hmm. like, I use it all the time and it works just as just as well. Yeah, and I'm like, what is happening in the world right now 
Well, whatever that study was, I'd be interested to see what they were comparing it to. Like, who did they yeah. per- for outperform 24% by? Were those people fatigued and not given carbs? Like, what were the other elements involved? Because maybe that one specific study saw a 24% improvement. But, like, across true. the board, when everything's equalized, we know that's not true. But that is funny that people didn't even question it. I think there's a lot of athletes using um, – Baking soda? What? What? Baking soda, like yeah. on the regular. I'm not going Which there. <laughs> Sounds like an seems experiment like a I'm not gamble. taking. <laughs> and that was the thing is like a lot of the comments were like, yeah, once you figure out the amount, it's okay. And they're like, it is it is hard to figure that out. But once you get it right, it's good. In case anyone missed our last uh, episode on bicarb, all we need to remind you of is the volcanoes <laughs> you made in school that have baking soda in them and you pour vinegar in. Your stomach is the vinegar. The baking soda is going straight in. So this is this is our concern. It's going to erupt one I, way or the other. Look, <laughs> yeah. but let's talk about the number 24%. Let's say that it does improve performance by 24%. That, I mean, I, yeah, I would take I'd that tomorrow. Let's, yep. mm-hmm. So yeah. wait a second. No, no. Let's just look at what that would mean. So you have run a 245 marathon, Meg. Mm. What would be 25% faster? I can't do that math. What is that? That'd be 14 14 minutes off per hour. So that would be like a half. Oh my God. Oh yeah, I'd be going, I'd be be breaking world records. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So let's just think about that. Yeah. Okay. But now you've got the 4% shoes on. Okay. (laughs) No, but I've already factored all that in. At some point you are going to be running, um, faster than time itself i mean let's like these numbers get thrown out there and someone throws percent on something and you're like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that sounds right there, no there was not w- one person questioning the percentage Guys. in the comments not a single oh, one see let this be a lesson to always question <laughs> stats on instagram anyway uh let's answer another listener question here so they said, when increasing mileage, I notice my sweat turns into hard salt clusters and mm-hmm. such on my skin. You should see your baseball hats. What's happening? Yeah. And then they kind of had a two part with that, which I thought was a good like segue off of Josh's conversation. Um, what would we recommend for this? A higher sodium intake. So if we notice visible salt crusted on our skin or on our clothing, we can automatically assume that we are a heavier sweater, a heavier, saltier sweater. So you know, it, yes, we can do the sweat composition that both Meg and I have done if we really want to dial in the numbers. Um, but if you're seeing crusty salt on your body on the regular, you are a very salty sweater. So the first place that we would start with something like that is just like we have a carb goal per hour in a race or in the long run, we'd have a sodium goal per hour. So a great place to start would be like 600 milligrams of sodium per hour and just notice how you feel. See if your performance is better, see if you recover better. Um, and then we can dial up from there, you know, if we need to, because an average sodium loss per liter of sweat is like 900 milligrams. So if you hopped on the scale, that would be like a two pound loss, like 900 milligrams, but a saltier sweater could be more like 1200 to 1600. And then they might lose twice that amount in an hour. So I've seen people lose 3000, 4000, you know, milligrams of sodium per hour, which is astronomical. Um, so then I think the second part of their question was, do we recommend like certain drinks for that? And one of the ones they recommend, they asked about was body armor. Body armor doesn't have sodium in it. So please don't drink body armor, whoever this salty Also skip is. Kool-Aid. Or Kool-Aid. You'll have to add some sodium to that. I, you know what's weird? We, you, had, you had just said a little while ago that some of these elite runners know salt. And I, I remember watching, like, I don't know what uh, marathon it was, but one of the guys that was finishing, I you could visibly see the streaks of salt on yeah. his skin and his singlet. Um, That's rare. And, you know, I've always uh, wondered why they don't do solid color singlets that often. And I'm thinking maybe it's so that their competitors can't see, yeah. like, the the what's yeah. going on with their yeah. physiology. I don't know. I mean, the biggest aha moment that deep. Yeah, I had with that was um, when Molly Seidel took um, bronze in the Olympics. Like, mm-hmm. no one expected her to do that. And the whole time I watched her, her beautiful ponytail was dry the entire race. And I was like, that's why she's tolerating the heat so well is because she doesn't sweat much and her performance was phenomenal, which of course is her training and stuff. But because she's not a sweaty human, it allowed her to endure 
the elements of that particular race to be able to let her fitness shine and finish third. So uh, meanwhile at Falmouth after a mile warm up, I drenched her with my <laughs> armpit when same. I threw my arm around her. I'm like, yeah, she must have loved that. So do you think it's like so the elite athletes always go and like train at altitude or in heat or in weather to like adjust to a hotter race or whatever. And some people have the ability to do that as well. But do you think there is more of a benefit to taking in more sodium during a race versus trying to just, I don't know, get tougher and train in, in heat and that kind of weather? So I think it depends on the person. There's definitely a use for getting acclimated to heat. But even like a super sweaty person like this listener who wrote in, it, they're never going to acclimate to a point that they're not going to yeah. have to pay attention to this, right? So that's a piece of it. Like some, yes, we're going to acclimate a little bit, um, but when it's this extreme, it, it's never going to turn into But that's nothing. a crazy thing that that Meg just brought up because she said, get tougher. The thing is, it's-, it's I did quotes. I know, but it's- I it, did quotes. quotes. People can't see that. <laughs> but what, what I do want to comment on that is that you can't out tough poor nutrition and Mm-mm. and Mm-mm. salt no. loss. So like no. as tough as you want to be, Meg, do you remember how tough you? Meg is one of the toughest runners I've ever met. Mm-hmm. And I remember when you were doing your leg cramp thing. Yeah, which was a lack and, of sodium 100%. and being on the ground yeah. and stuff like that. You couldn't outrun that. You couldn't out tough that mm-hmm. thing, even though you came in first place after laying on the ground for a while <laughs> and then getting back up and finishing the race, which was pretty cool to see. I wish but I saw that. heartbreaking because she was like a 303 marathon that day or 30, like 30030 or something like oh, that. Painful. Um, okay. Did we answer all of her questions about sodium? I think so. Okay. Let's answer one final question here. This says, my question is about using never second gels for running fuel. I recently started using them and love them. Awesome flavors, easy to get down and sits well in my stomach. As a heavy, salty sweater who trains for marathons, I was especially drawn to them for the higher sodium content. My question, I previously used gels with way less sodium and would make sure I'm taking in plenty of electrolyte drinks in addition to the gels. Now with the never second gels, those alone are getting me 400 milligrams of sodium per hour, taking one every 30 minutes. Is there any concern with taking in too much sodium if I'm using the never second plus an electrolyte drink? I'm curious if there are adjustments that need to be made with using a high sodium gel. This is when we tell them that, uh, I think it was Ryan Detter or Rob, was it Robbie who put in a whole tea- tablespoon of oh salt gosh. and water and drank it? At the 50K, Robbie needed salt and they didn't have like prepackaged anything out there, but they did have a bowl of table salt that you could that roll you could like potatoes, dip in. a potato in because this is an ultra and that's what they have at the stations. Yeah. Yeah. Instead, he just took a giant spoonful and mixed it into water and, and drank it. Drank it, and he came back and he just Googled what is like a tablespoon of salt, and it's seven thousand milligrams of sodium. And he said it was really bad. Yeah, but he finished and did not have a blowout. Yeah. Okay. So I'm shocked that yeah. that amount of sodium. He's got a real sensitive gut, man. I've heard his stories. Um, yeah. Yeah, but think about that. Like, if she's asking if, if the never seconds and then a little bit of little bit of uh, Gatorade's gonna make a problem, I don't. I don't think it's gonna. We all. I mean, just like we said for the last question, we said like 600 milligrams of sodium an hour is a great place to start as a salty sweater, mm-hmm. and then most people even need a little more than that. So. She's totally fine. 400 milligrams with an electrolyte drink on top. She's not going to, she'll be totally fine. So I get this. And maybe she has enough time to test it. Yeah. I started doing the untapped. Mm. And I think that has salt in it as well. Less than never second, but it does. It does. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I was going to ask you if I need to bump up, but I think I'm pretty good if I do the hyperhydration or the element uh, Mm -hmm. the night before and then sip a little bit on the day of and then take those gels or do you think i'll need to jack that up a little bit if the weather is cooperative in boston i think that's fine but if it looks like it's going to be warmer we'll find out a plan to add a little more in there yeah because i was i've i've always hated that the mortons don't have any sodium because it would just be so like much easier in my Mm -hmm. mind to not have to worry about adding that but even Mm -hmm. with 400 milligrams an hour through a gel you still have you still need more than that so you're still she gonna might. have to carry a bottle of some mm-hmm. sort i mean i th- i think i would need to yeah. yeah 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 i know it's i part of me wants to play with never second this summer and just see if i like it just because it would make it so much mm-hmm. easier to get more sodium but 
know. We'll see. Wait, did you see the yeah. new Morton gel holder thing? No. Like you just you do sh- a- you put five gels into this like flask. Um, it's like a soft flask. Soft flask. So that you just carry that. But I'm like, how do you get the right amount? And also that's disgusting. You just got to keep <laughs> sipping the whole time. So I don't I know. I see that with untapped or never second, like putting that in a bottle because you could have a notch and just drink to that notch and it's thin. Sure. How are you going to get a oh, jello shot out of there? Like that sounds Jeez. real hard. I would put something up. I'd put a thinner one in a flask in a heartbeat, but not, I don't know about Morton. Um, okay, that does it for today. Thank you everyone for listening. As always, if you have a question we haven't answered, you can send us an email at fuel for the soul podcast at gmail.com and um, we'll answer it here on the show. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs> I said I just tried the Trader Joe's peas and carrots candy. There's not enough carrots. The peas to carrot ratio is off. So, it's also a weird sour candy. All right. All right. Bye, everyone. Peas and Hi. carrots. <laughs> Does it taste like peas and carrots? No, it tastes like a sour patch peas. should be the quote this week coats my pipe coats my pipe Um, (laughs) or jaguar what was the clone that works are you talking about sex panther yeah sex panther (laughs) i knew that 60 percent of the time it It works works every every time time. okay hey who's calling (laughs) edit that out (laughs) i have a amazon prescription delivery for megan it says ozempic Hey, I tried the Trader Joe's peas You're and not carrots. Gonna, oh, that's what I was waiting for. I was waiting for peas and carrots. I like, did. why I wasn't saying anything? Say, just say it. I, I did just say that. Say it.